60 Minutes Rewind. One of the most significant efforts to study changes in the climate has been taking place near the top of the world. It's a place called Peterman Glacier in Greenland, one of the largest glaciers in the Arctic Circle and a glacier that has experienced dramatic melting. It is a harsh and dangerous environment, and it has drawn some of the world's leading climate scientists who are only able to work there a little over a month a year. We wanted to see how that work is proceeding, how they're able to move equipment and people in such a hostile place, and what they've discovered so far. So we went to the top of the world to find out. Our journey took us 700 miles above the Arctic Circle to the U.S.'s Thule Air Force Base in northern Greenland, built at the start of the Cold War to watch for Soviet missiles. It is an alien landscape, home to curious Arctic hares and packs of prehistoric-looking muskox. From there... Hi. Hi. I'm Welcome Sharon. Welcome to Greenland. Thank I'm Malik. We flew even further. The destination, Peterman Glacier. It's on the northwest coast of Greenland, just a few hundred miles south of the North Pole. To get there in a helicopter took us four hours over a rarely seen landscape that is both severe and serene. The last town we'd see was Kanak, with 700 residents and more huskies than people. Locked in by ice nine months of the year, villagers have always hunted seal and narwhal to survive. Greenland is three times the size of Texas, and 80% of it is covered in ice. But it now loses more ice than it gains in snowfall every year. We saw evidence of the imbalance everywhere. Blue gashes across the ice, rivers of rushing meltwater, and the occasional thunderous crack, icebergs dropping into the sea. We still had 300 miles to go. Stopped twice to refuel along the way. These barrels were left behind for us by the scientists who made the trip to Peterman Glacier three weeks earlier. This is the ultimate self-service gas station. Yeah. <laughs> the middle of nowhere. And this will keep us going for how much longer? Yeah, we can fly two and a half hours. Our pilots, native Greenlanders, kept a rifle nearby at each stop to protect us from polar bears. Have you seen polar bears out here? Yeah, yeah. a lot. So now it's ready. <laughs> now we're safe. Finally, we arrived at Peterman Glacier. Oh, there's the camp. And spotted the ice camp below. <laughs> Great to see you. <laughs> so who did you upset to get put out here? <laughs> oh, no, the gods, the gods. <laughs> Keith Nichols is an expert in drilling in remote places. And in terms of remote, this would be really hard to beat. It feels like you're on another planet. If you could take a walk around here, you could be expecting Scotty to beam you up. I mean, <laughs> it is extraordinary. Nichols and a team of scientists were drawn to this remote sliver of Greenland, in part by these satellite images. In 2010, a chunk of ice four times the size of Manhattan broke off. Then, two years later, another large chunk came down. The glacier has receded by 20 miles in five years. Nichols and his team are trying to drill beneath it. This is a lot of work in difficult conditions. What do you hope to learn? What we're trying to learn is how the oceans are interacting with the ice, how they're melting it. We're trying to predict how in the future that melting might change. To drill through the ice, they heated meltwater from the glacier to make a hot water drill to pierce through the 300 foot thick ice. There has to be serious challenge to running equipment like this in this kind of weather. The biggest challenge is we've got water and it's very cold. So if we have water freezing in hoses, that can be devastating for the projects. This is the moment the coring machine struck the bottom of the sea floor. A half mile beneath the ice, they made history. It was the first time anyone has ever collected sediment from beneath the ice shelf in Greenland. The ocean beneath ice shelves is probably the least accessible part of the world ocean. And 
Uh, just, just getting access to that is a triumph, frankly, as far as we're concerned. The ice shelf extends out from the glacier and floats on the ocean. They believe it acts like a dam, holding back the ice from sliding into the sea. If it goes away, sea levels go up. Is there a sense of urgency in the work that you're doing? So sea level rise is the big, is the big question that we're trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And Peter Glacier, this experiment here, uh, gives us an opportunity uh, to get at those processes, to start to try and understand the basic physics as to how, how that can happen. Our visit to the ice camp was cut short. Our pilots warned us something called ice fog was moving in and could strand us here for days. We hightailed it back to the helicopter, heading to another outpost of the expedition, what the scientists call Boulder Camp, set up on the edge of Peterman Glacier. Sean Marcotte and a team of geologists have been here for weeks, gathering samples from rocks. So this is probably deposited when the ice was maybe a few hundred to a few thousand feet thicker. And when it was deposited, you're probably talking about maybe five, six hundred feet of ice above us. Above where we are. Above where we are now. Peterman would have been much larger and it would have been dropping these rocks all over the surface. To the person at home who's looking at you guys just chipping away at rocks and going, why should I care about this? We know that if you warm the planet up, the glaciers respond, they melt. The question is, at what rate? How fast is that going to happen? And where is it going to happen? And where are the most vulnerable spots of this ice sheet? To understand all of that, you have to understand how the ice sheet, what controls an ice sheet. We need to understand this glacier so that we can provide a better prediction for the larger ice sheet. That matters to us because of sea level. If these glaciers can respond dynamically, then we should all be concerned because that can create dynamic changes in sea level and flood infrastructure. And we need to know that for planning for the future. We camped out next to the scientists. With 24 hours of light, we slept in these tents under the midnight sun. In the morning, we were shuttled out to meet the Odin, a Swedish icebreaker making its way around Peterman Glacier. The Odin supports the scientists on land and acts as a floating laboratory. Named after a Norse god who relentlessly sought wisdom, it's home to more than 50 climate scientists from around the world with similar convictions. Their work is funded mostly by the Swedish government and the U.S.'s National Science Foundation. Larry Mayer is one of the geologists on the Odin. He's using sonar to map the ocean floor, creating the first detailed maps that show how Peterman Glacier slid into the sea. You can see it, like skid marks of a car at an accident scene. Yeah, the ice went here and the ice went there. And we can see it, oh, and it stopped here. How much of the world's oceans have been mapped with this kind of detail? Oh, probably uh, on the order of six or seven percent. Very, very little, okay. yeah. The story will continue after this. You can only make the trip to Peterman Glacier a few weeks each summer when the ice melts enough to allow passage. You can see those blocks of ice drifting by. Expedition leader Alan Mix is running the ship's coring operation, trying to grab sediment from the sea floor. It's actually our coring site right now is under that block of ice, and we just can't get there. So we're, we're trying to drift with the ice and just sort of sneak up on it gently. It's hard to sneak up on anything in an icebreaker. The Odin doesn't so much a sail as it does smash the ice like a 13,000 ton hammer. Once in position, they throw something called a piston core, like a dart, at the bottom of the ocean. Oh, that doesn't sound good. After multiple attempts. Go to the next one, but we'll hit it with a gravity core. A core sample like this is collected. Inside the ship's lab, the multi-year process of investigating those cores begins. What's your best guess? How old is this? So the base of this core probably is no more than 10,000 years. Ann Jennings is with the Institute of Arctic and Alpine Research. She says each core holds clues about Peterman Glacier's past. Well, we didn't really expect to find things living under the ice shelf, but we have. What have you found? This one we found is called Sibisidoides wollerstorfi. It has a big name for a little it's bug. Easy for you to say. It looks like a little seashell. 
And it is a seashell, but it's a single-celled animal. That single-celled animal, like all living creatures, is made out of carbon, allowing scientists to determine when it lived. Which tells you what? The age of the sediments. So we can take then the depth scale here and convert it to age. And then we can say, when did the ice retreat? How quickly did it retreat? Was there a lot of meltwater coming you out? You can get all that from what looks like mud. Yes. After a week in Greenland, we headed home. But the scientists kept working, taking advantage of the final days of the short Arctic summer. The 66 core samples they collected during their month at sea will be studied by scientists around the world for decades. This is the largest core repository in the world. Peter Domenical is a paleoclimatologist at Columbia University. He says the cores collected in Greenland are like a black box of the Earth's inner workings. This one he collected just south of Greenland. So this is today's climate, mm -hmm. and we've had about 10,000 years of relatively warm climate. And then we go 10,000 years in the past, boom, there's the last ice age. This is when Long Island was formed, when Cape Cod was formed. You can go on and you can just find this color, and this is filled with these rocks, what we called ice rafted detritus, until this period when, whoa, there's another warm phase, and then another cold phase, and then another warm phase a short cold phase, a longer warm phase, and then boom, another ice age. And so you've had cold, warm, cold, warm, cold, warm today. How do we know that the warming we're seeing now, and how do we not know it's part of this warm, cold, warm, cold? That's a great question. These transitions are gradual and kind of almost like a tide wave or something. Mm -hmm. And this transition, when you get to today, goes boom, suddenly very warm. Dominical says the cores pulled from Peterman Glacier will fill in a crucial piece of the climate change puzzle. How impressive was it that they got to Peterman Glacier? It's impressive. What's more impressive is that we haven't been there every year and that we're not, going, not doing this every year. We should be doing this. We should be monitoring this whole system with much greater uh, focus than we are now. How quickly have we seen the changes in Greenland? The changes that are happening right now as a result of human activities are remarkable and they're happening incredibly fast and they're, it's not only happening fast, but it's accelerating. Uh, and it's important to really get our mind around what we're saying there. We're not just saying that climate in the Arctic is changing, it's changing at an accelerating rate. So it basically means it's starting to melt, but it's melting at a faster and faster clip. So anyone who knows what it's like to fall off a cliff, <laughs> that's what it's doing.